Thank you very much. And without further ado, let me turn it over to Chris Pissaridis, um, the London School of Economics, and he'll be discussing the last two presentations. Would you All like right. to share your slides? Thank you very much. Yes, I'm going to do that when I figure out. Uh, okay, here we are. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed all the presentations that, today. Um, of course, my focus is going to be the last two, and uh, I've uh, talked many times to Albert when we were colleagues at uh, Hong Kong UST for parts of the year. And of course, Linda is just around the corner, a sibling institution in London. And, um, and, and, and I really like what they, they said. I have some questions, of course. Um, so what I'm going to do is to uh, give you some general remarks about um, technology and uh, how it's related to aging, and then talk uh, more uh, specifically about the two presentations. Now, the, the first point I want to make is one that Albert mentioned right at the end. I think we haven't given enough um, importance to this, but I think it's extremely important. And it's the fact that with the new digital technologies, we really have a choice how to use it. You see, we, we're conditioned by manufacturing, I think, when we talk about uh, technology. And, and of course, my, the, the big technologies of the past, um, where it's, it was obvious what to do. It was a no-brainer, as I can say. You know, think of the railways. Railways come along, of course, you know what you're going to do. You're going to replace your horse and cart and, and your canal and the boats by trains, and that's the end of the story, and productivity increases, and you expand into new lands and all that. But new digital technologies, though, they don't apply mainly in manufacturing. They apply throughout the economy, and, and, and we have a choice of what to do. You know, you could use your robots to replace labor, or, or you could use them to do heavy manual tasks and complement labor. Both speakers mentioned that, in fact, as a, as, as a choice. Uh, you could use drones to kill people, or you could use drones to save the environment by going to inaccessible places to uh, monitor what's happening and then spray whatever you need to spray to kill diseases, for example. And, and there are many, many other examples. And, it, it, and we have to be aware of that. That's, that. that's a very important point about these new technologies. And, and the obvious answer in how, how to use them is what you might call tech for good. Uh, we see where there's room for improvement in society, direct your uh, technological research there and see how you can improve things. Now, what social challenges are anticipated in the future? Again, do your research on um, how these new technologies can facilitate uh, society can make it easier for society to deal with these uh, future challenges. And finally, we didn't mention it here today because it's not related to aging, I guess, but we, you could say what well, causes climate change, like technology, monitor, reverse, mitigate, uh, and, and, and adapt to these uh, new um, uh, developments, you know, <clears throat> don't direct it to fighting wars, which unfortunately um, it's very difficult, it's easier to say than, um, than achieve, uh, than put into practice. Now, aging is, a, I, I look at aging as a big social challenge. The population aging is both, it's an economic challenge, it's a social and it's a financial challenge. It's economic because our social norms and workday structures do not encourage economic engagement of older people. Uh, we have a shrinking labor force. Linda emphasized that it's the uh, most recent talk, so that's the one that comes to mind, but practically every speaker mentioned that. It's a social uh, challenge because our societies and health systems were designed <clears throat> with many young people living until their late 60s, uh, as we were a few older people in mind, you know, when age 65 became the norm for retirement. I think life expectancy was about 66 or 67, um, not so long ago. And it's a financial challenge because pensions were designed with that in mind as well. And other social support mechanisms, including public funded health, I guess. And, um, and most of them are now unsustainable given the way society is going, if we're going to maintain those same um, 
uh, kind of commitments we gave uh, back then. And again, there they, they were many several talks that mentioned this uh, today. Now, what, uh, what about Albert? What I like about Albert is that those five, um, um, <clears throat> what, what can we call it? The, the five bubbles, if you like, that you mentioned about uh, what technology does. Um, I, I thought it was his own invention, actually, but as he admitted, it, it, he found it when he arrived at the ADP. It's okay, that I'm sure you'll develop it well, Albert. And, um, and especially what I liked about directing uh, uh, technology got changed to um, improving the situation in the labor market would be the last three that you mentioned is that uh, that uh, technology can help in skill development. I'm going to say some more things about each one a bit later. It can improve the matching of workers to tasks as workers age, and it can improve the health uh, of people and, uh, and the healthy longevity. Now, skill development first. The best way to develop skills, I believe, is when um, you succeed, uh, that the worker will feel that, that he or she owns the uh, learning and, and the uh, training. And digital learning with the aid of a personal computer is the best way to ensure that there is ownership. You put, essentially, you put the training program on your firm's intranet, and you let workers do it <clears throat> and fill in various tests, for example, and then uh, whoever is the line manager checks those, and then the worker the, the owns that training. It's not something that is someone that tells them do this and do that. Um, now you might say, uh, would they be able to use computers? Well, it, it was mentioned that he actually was Albert who emphasized it was Albert who emphasized that uh, maybe older people are not very good with computers. I, I don't really believe that. I guess we're aging quickly, maybe. But computers have been around for a long time, you know, since the 80s in uh, developed countries, 90s elsewhere. And workers entering the labor force in the 1970s uh, just grew up with them. I mean, look, I mean, look at us here. Several, some, if not several of us are not in what uh, William Shakespeare called our salad days, and yet we are so, so good using these computers. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking to each other. And, and I'm sure that's uh, more generally the case. Technophobia, as I call it, is a thing of the past. All the people know how to use computers, so let them use to up, uh, upskill themselves. Now, Linda referred to brain or muscle. I guess the traditional thing is brain or brawn, although it's always a risk that you might misspell brawn, but I checked it and that's the way that it's spelled. Now, all the people are better matched to brain, there is no doubt. <clears throat> and it makes them complementary to robots which is the ultimate uh, brawn machine. They do heavy uh, muscle tasks. And we've seen that in the um, data that um, Albert uh, summarized, he referred to as a multiple a number of times. There are others who show the same thing, that all the people benefit from the introduction of robots. There's less manual work to do. They are complementary to robots. And again, as a society is aging, you know, Japan is an example that comes to mind immediately here, introduce more robots into your uh, manufacturing, but make sure that they work well with uh, uh, the older people that you have in abundance. Now, what about the third uh, bubble, the health? Um, I'm sure we're all going to need the tender care of a human being as we age, at least I hope we do, but um, digital technologies can assist with diagnosis, treatment options, learning your limits, I've just done one of those tests actually about my limits. That's why it's new to mine. They just put you on the treadmill and they push you until the, until the machine tells them when you've reached the limit. Um, re re retirement, I bet. I, I think again, that point was mentioned in fact before uh, in, in the early presentation in the first section that I believe that retirement should be, should be on the basis of health status not at fixed uh, specific ages. I should have put ages there rather than dates. I think what it's, it's what was called the, um, I don't know, it was given a name that was really nice actually, but you know what I mean. Um, and uh, of course, pensions and financial incent incentives should be structured around health status. These are points that were made in abundance in the past. Now, what about Linda's pr uh, presentation? Well, we all agree, I think, that all the people ought to and most likely will want to work into older ages. Um, because they're healthy. Linda mentioned mid 70s. I'm happy even to go beyond if I can. Um, she's given us a thought provoking analysis of the life cycle 
that forget the three stages that uh, you know the the Friedman the, the Modigliani model of consumption that we still teach to our graduate students of the life cycle should be forgotten. Um, it's no longer the way to think about it. We should think of changing roles and identities during the life cycle. Um, now, why did change? Well, first, our abilities change, and so our comparative advantages change, and we push in the direction of increased, uh, we should aim to go in the direction of increased comparative advantage that we have. All the people uh, have the comparative advantage at running things. That's why Linda mentioned um, self-employment. You know, when, when, you be, when you set up your own business, then you, then you run things, that, that's where your advantage moves, whereas younger people are, are, are better at learning how to run things when they reach the cycle, when they run their own businesses in their 50s, as Linda mentioned. Um, now, you might, as you grow older, you might want to choose a job that involves fewer hours outside the home, uh, and uh, learning how to make these transitions into tasks that we are better at as we age is a key to uh, having a happy, uh, older age. Now, is that easy? Well, this is where I might disagree a little. I think Linda made it sound like, you know, of course we can do it and it's a great thing. I know it's a great thing, but I do think identity is a very, very strong um, property, right? As I call it in quotation marks for, for, for many people. And um, it's not easy to change it. Uh, you know, I mean, you hear things like, that's what I learned to do and that's what I want to do until I retire something that we hear all the time and we have our identities in our networks and this is our social capital it's our accumulated wealth of experience we don't give it up easily in fact i've been thinking that um, when i was working on markets with frictions i wish i thought of identity i didn't if i were to rewrite my book on um, on, on the equilibrium of the labor market with frictions what's called the equilibrium and employment theory uh, i would add identity is a friction that needs to change when workers become unemployed and uh, look for other jobs because you either put, put, put your, um, you know, what horses have to, <laughs> I've forgotten my English today, I don't know what's happening. I'm giving me a lecture in Greek tomorrow and maybe that's why I've been thinking, how am I going to manage? But you, you could either just see what's, um, <clears throat> what you've been doing and look for a job only in that narrow area or you could extend your horizon and look for a job across uh, the market. And that's when you give up your identity. Well, that's a friction that is not easily uh, given up. So I hope there are younger people working on frictions listening to me study identity. Um, now, necessity, of course, makes us change. I remember in Soviet times, uh, I went to um, Israel and um, there were many stories of Soviet trained uh, engineers, Jewish engineers who got out of the Soviet Union and they were becoming taxi drivers in Israel. That was a change of necessity. They were complaining. I remember talking to one or two. In fact, it was a complete change of identity. But the skills they acquired there were not usable in their new uh, country, either because there were too many or because they were a different type that were needed in that economy. And um, Linda's argument, of course, is correct that it would be better aging world if we were not tied down to identity. It is persuasive, but um, how, how would we do it? Would we choose to do it <clears throat> or uh, and, and have a happier retirement or would we gradually accept obsolescence of our type and sink into poverty and retirement? I do know examples of people who've done that. I won't mention stories, I don't have time, <laughs> but, uh, but, but it does happen. Two minutes. Now, yeah. Two minutes. All right, very quick. Um, it's absolutely right, as Linda emphasized, that the role of companies in this transition is extremely important. They ought to give up on agents, make it possible for all the people to have all their roles, change their production process, introduce flexibility. I agree entirely that companies play a very important role there. What about COVID-19? Well, here I, I sort of sense some, some irony actually there because, um, Many companies resisted such changes, and then COVID-19 came along and it forced them to move to age-friendly practices, working from home, using more uh, communications technology, and being more flexible. As long as results were delivered, they introduced surveillance, 
So the irony is that, that I sense here is that COVID-19 is making life more difficult for older people because older people get much more, much more sick than younger people. Life is much more at risk. Uh, so for as long as COVID-19 is active, older people bear the brunt of the disease, but maybe it will compensate them when um, uh, COVID finally departs and it leaves behind a legacy of age-friendly arrangements in the labor market. And um, the older people of that age have a happier retirement. Thank you all for listening. Stop share now. All right. Yeah.